All right, you're on, Frank. All right, I'm gonna share my screen. Hopefully, this is gonna work. Okay, is my screen coming through? Uh, no. Uh -oh. yeah. Let me see. Do I need to make you? Oh, now it's, I'm now I'm seeing it. All right, there it is. <laughs> awesome. Cool. Okay, so um, yeah, the picture you see in the background here is the Okoloto power station in Finland. Um, which is supposed to be the largest nuclear plant uh, in the world. And I think uh, they completed it um, quite recently. So um, this is the newest fleet in the world. There's, I believe, uh, a little bit over 400 reactors uh, in the world today with about uh, up to, I believe, 50 reactors being built. Um, so this is where things are uh, right now. Uh, so outline of today's talk, uh, nuclear power um, in the world today, uh, and then the science behind how the conventional nuclear or fission reactors work. Uh, and then I will uh, do a brief intro to some of the newer types of reactors that uh, we keep talking about, and then uh, touch upon uh, nuclear fission, fusion, which is uh, based on a, a very different concept. So this lecture uh, was based or is based on some of the talks I give uh, at universities uh, once or twice uh, a year. And it's, uh, it's actually a, a course uh, on energy uh, um, for people who are trying to understand some of the challenges and opportunities to uh, developing technologies. Uh, so I think as a background, uh, you know, yeah, why, why should we uh, pursue nuclear. So nuclear, uh, in many sense, is a lot more compact and easier to um, uh, manage than uh, different other clean energy sources like solar or wind. Uh, for example, for the equivalent of one nuclear reactor that uh, would take uh, about one um, square mile of space, you would need 450 uh, solar panels. And so um, Based on this, you would see that a nuclear is uh, much easier to deploy in in, um, in many ways. And so, uh, for example, a typical reactor, which is one gigawatt, and one gigawatt is about enough power to power 700,000 homes. So for the equivalent, you need about um, 3.1 million solar PV panels. And um, it'll, it'll also be the equivalent of 431 uh, large-scale uh, wind turbines. So these are the very, very large ones that you would typically install uh, offshore. A nuclear reactor uh, would also be the equivalent of powering 100 million LED light bulbs or um, around 2,000 Corvettes. So that's the equivalent in terms of the power output of a nuclear reactor. Uh, and of course, we've been talking a lot about some of the clean energy benefits and its safety. Uh, so this is data that uh, was recently updated um, at the website Our World in Data. And what this tries to do is to quantify 
the death rate um, from associated pollution and accidents to the different uh, energy sources. So on the right hand side, we see the equivalent deaths uh, among the different energy sources. And in comparison to coal, um, nuclear power, um, there's hardly people who, who die from it. And so uh, this is on a per terawatt hour basis, terawatt hour being a uh, standard unit of how much energy is uh, produced. So um, this is the data that uh, is the basis for the Got Nuclear app that we're working on in terms of describing how many deaths we can avert by preventing the pollution that's not produced uh, when we supplant it with nuclear energy. Um, and at the same time, we also uh, see that nuclear energy produces far, far less uh, greenhouse gas emissions, namely CO2, because it's not burning uh, fossil fuels in the process. And so we see that um, both on the health and from a climate perspective, nuclear power is overwhelmingly uh, safer and cleaner uh, than all the fossil fuels and even safer than uh, hydropower. Um, and so um, we do see a small number of deaths uh, in here, 0.07 per terawatt, and that accounts for uh, the one radiation death that occurred uh, during Fukushima and some of the ac uh, people who died during uh, the Chernobyl disaster. So nuclear today, uh, there's about 450 reactors in operation across 30 countries and they provide 11% of the world's electricity. Um, but it's not 11% of the energy, it's actually if you talk about all energy, which includes industrial transportation and other um, uh, uses of energy, then nuclear only accounts for about 4%. Uh, in terms of the big uh, powers today, they include the US, France, Russia, China, and Korea. And so on this graph, we see um, the number of plants that are um, being built over the last uh, 50 years. And we still see that, um, yeah, in spite of the fact that US has barely uh, built any plants, it's still the number one um, um, producer of power using nuclear. So if we break it down, um, US is first, France is second. So in, in the US uh, with nuclear power, uh, I believe it provides about 20% of all the electricity Whereas in France, which is a, a much smaller country, uh, as a percentage, I believe it provides about 75% of all its electricity. And so, so we see that um, China and Russia are also not far behind. In terms of uh, new plants which are being built, it's anywhere between 50 and 60 today. Uh, China is in the lead, um, followed by Russia. And so, um, under construction are about 20 plants. Uh, a couple of them have actually come online this year. And for them, that marks a milestone. Um, They're not only um, uh, putting out um, plants that are um, uh, engineered totally from their own technology, but they're also applying it in ways that um, haven't been used uh, in the US uh, for example, uh, using nuclear power to uh, heat, provide district heating. So this is a way of trans transferring heat uh, to um, urban areas uh, using um, steam tunnels and, and coolers, chillers to uh, provide heating and cooling uh, needs for, for the buildings. So um, a brief background on how these reactors work. So we wanna begin with the fundamental reaction, which is the nuclear fission reaction. And fission means uh, breaking apart. Uh, and so in a conventional plant, we use a, a fuel uh, like uranium. And uranium's uh, well suited for this because it's, um, it's, un it's unstable in the sense that if you are able to uh, shoot a, a neutron into uh, a mass of, of uh, uranium metal, it can break apart and the process, this is called fission. Uh, and so in 
in this graph, you see that uh, an, one single neutron bombards the, the core of a uranium atom, and that causes to split up into uh, two smaller pieces plus uh, additional neutrons. And these neutrons can then go uh, and bombard uh, other uraniums in, this, in your material, or I could split uh, some of the already uh, smaller uh, nuclei. And this process uh, can continue uh, on and on, and it's called a nuclear reaction, a chain reaction. If you do not control it, uh, of course, then you get a nuclear bomb. But with some clever science, uh, they use moderators, which slow this down. So you're able to have a controlled reaction, which releases heat uh, in, um, in a slow manner that your, your reactor does not blow up. Um, and so we're you know, where does the heat come from? So this is where Einstein's equation E equals mc squared comes into play. So uh, on the left-hand side, you see one reaction where um, neutron hits an uranium and it breaks it apart uh, into two smaller nuclei plus three uh, neutrons. But it turns out that if you add the weight of the uh, two products plus the three neutrons, it's actually slightly, um, slightly heavier than the combined um, reactants, which are the, um, the neutron and the uranium atom. And that loss in mass, which is converted into heat, is where we get uh, nuclear power. Uh, and so uh, the equivalent is that um, for, um, for every kilogram of uranium, uh, what well, we get uh, about 2.5 million times more energy than the equivalent of one kilogram of coal that you burn. So we see that uh, nuclear power is about uh, at least six orders of magnitude more dense uh, than, than fuel. So that means if you were to operate um, a coal plant, uh, like a typical one gigawatt coal plant, you would need six 1,700 tons of coal per day. Um, but in contrast, you'd only need um, uh, several pounds of, of uranium for that one day's operation. So you can see how much less fuel you would need uh, to operate a power plant. And so, um, yeah, how does a reactor actually work and produce electricity? So if you look on the left-hand side, you see a reactor vessel, and this is where you would put um, the uranium material. So the material being these fuel pellets. And, and so uh, when you control the reaction, you have heat produced in these rods. Uh, you have coolant that comes in. So a typical reactor uses uh, water. The water comes in, it's converted into steam, and the steam um, turn, um, um, moves a turbine uh, at very high speeds, and this uh, generates electricity. So it's the opposite of a motor. Instead of electricity driving a motor, what you have is a turbine that drives a generator, and that, um, that movement is then converted into electrical current, and it's sent uh, to your transmission grid. Um, and so how, how does the, um, the water or the coolant uh, get recycled? So once the steam exits the turbine, it gets cooled down. And so this is why nuclear reactors are next to the coastline or uh, next to a river. So the, this is the water from the river. Uh, it comes in, it chills the steam, and then that water is reused back in the reactor. So the water from the ocean or the river does not get mixed. These are independent. Uh, systems, only heat is being transferred here. But um, what we see here is there's a need for a reactor to be uh, next um, to a, a water source that can cool it down. Uh, so nuclear power is uh, in, a, in a state of transition right now. And these are some of the findings that, that came out of a report uh, that we helped sponsor a couple years ago um, from MIT. And so one, uh, among the challenges is that um, the, um, the institutional memory for nuclear power is uh, actually on decline as many countries are now hesitant or kind of wavering in terms of what they want to do. Um, another challenge is that 
um, e even though, for example, Korea is an innovator in nuclear, there's the government now has um, um, come off uh, in in favor of phasing it out. Um, and so uh, Germany, we, we see the same story of them moving away from nuclear. Um, Taiwan is uh, in a state of hiatus. Uh, I, I think the government is um, uh, prepared to shut down the remaining reactors. Um, another challenge is that the costs have gone up um, and that's due to uh, regulatory issues that have been far more uh, difficult to, to uh, manage than the technical issues. Um, at the same time, we see that renewables are getting far cheaper and I believe now solar uh, is being uh, sold as, as cheap as 1.5 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, the opportunities are that um, in the face of climate change, nuclear may be the fastest energy source to produce uh, clean power. It's also um, pollution free and uh, environmental groups uh, among whom we have been trying to um, uh, communicate with are also changing their minds and uh, government programs like uh, the DOE and ARPA-E are now providing more um, more funding for uh, newer uh, types of nuclear power. Um, so quick summary, um, at least 1.5, 1.3 billion dollars in, in private capital has been invested over 50 uh, companies in the advanced uh, nuclear space. And this means looking at technologies where the coolant is not just water, but uh, using more advanced materials or solutions like molten salt. Uh, for example, the technology that terrestrial energy uses, uh, Kairos and even uh, TerraPower. Uh, and so these reactors are often called uh, small modular reactors because they can be scaled down to much smaller sizes. Um, uh, you know, typical reactors today are between 500 megawatts and one gigawatt, whereas these um, are down to uh, 200 megawatts or even uh, smaller than that. Uh, so here's a couple examples of these reactors. The one on the very right here is the IMSR, and this is the one that Terrestrial um, has been working on. One of the advantages of these reactors is that they also operate at much higher temperatures than the reactors we do uh, we have today, which are closer to around four to five hundred degrees, whereas um, terrestrials can go up to seven hundred. And this means you can do um, use that use that uh, heat for industrial purposes, um, and so that gives you new applications that we haven't done before. And and finally, um, I know we're running on time. I just want to. Um, briefly describe uh, nuclear fusion, um, which is uh, a different form of, of nuclear power. Uh, instead of breaking down um, heavy elements, what we're doing is we're combining um, light elements like uh, hydrogen um, and its isotope deuterium um, and using that to produce power. So nuclear fusion um, relies on on, on plasmas, which is uh, um, considered a fourth state of matter. So solids, uh, as we're, we're familiar with, are molecules which have um, a regularity. And, and so solids are, are uh, anything from your table to rocks, to glass, to steel. And then we have liquids, uh, which, you know, in which the molecules can flow past each other. Um, and of course, what we breathe are gases, but Beyond that, uh, when you have put, impart higher energy into the atoms, what happens is the electrons fly off of the atoms. And so what you have is a gas of, of charges. And this is what we find in stars and, and the sun. Uh, and so the sun, of course, is the most um, um, relevant example in terms of what nuclear fission, fusion does. So under very high pressures and temperatures, um, these, the nuclei of hydrogen and smaller atoms can uh, fuse. Uh, and so these are the fundamental fuels that we consider when we talk about fusion. So the nuclei um, under very high pressures and temperatures can combine to produce higher elements. So in this example, we have a, nucle a deuterium nucleus here on the top and then tritium. Uh, and so these are isotopes of hydrogen. And 
when they fuse, what we get is uh, a one neutron and a um, um, helium nucleus. So this becomes the uh, set core of a helium atom. And this process, uh, um, similar to what we see in fusion, is that we, we see a little loss of, of mass in this process, and that's converted to the energy that we see um, coming out of the sun. Uh, so this is a schematic of um, one of the, uh, the main forms of a nuclear fusion reactor. So there are several which are being um, uh, under development right now, but this is what you call tokamak. And so in the center, you see this uh, ring here. Uh, and, and these rings are, you know, um, are magnets. Uh, and what happens is that the plasma is encapsulated inside this uh, toroidal structure and it's held by the uh, magnetic fields that you produce by the, by the rings around it. And so um, in a reactor, what happens is that it would send a pulse and that causes the, um, uh, the pressure and uh, temperature to increase very, very quickly and uh, cause it to fuse. So um, something like this could even be a, constructed in a garage. And we've seen examples of uh, high school uh, students constructing their own reactor. And, and so in very small quantities, heat is uh, being produced, but it's not enough to be uh, net energy positive. So, um, you know, by driving the magnets, you're still putting more energy into the system than you are getting out of it. But the science shows that the, these reactors are getting better and better. Um, so this is sort of um, a graph of how, <clears throat> how fusion, fusion is progressing. These are milestones in terms of reactors that have been uh, produced. Uh, IDER is the one that um, is under a lot of um, attention as it's, um, it's the biggest, but also the most expensive reactor that's being produced. Um, <clears throat> so under, um, um, under operational conditions, supposedly, um, either would be able to produce more energy than uh, you need to put in. And that would, um, that's just only a demonstration, right? Um, and so even with this working, we're only seeing that the energy produced would only last for a few seconds. So this is a proof of concept. Um, and they expect this to be achieved around <clears throat> um, 2035. So, <clears throat> by all means, this means that fusion could um, could be could produce you know cheap uh, energy very cheaply. I mean, <clears throat> clean energy very cheaply, but it could take a very very long time until it's commercially um, commercially viable. So yeah, um, this is uh, sort of a background in terms of the the latest technologies um, in nuclear fission and fusion. Excellent. Thank you very much, Frank. Uh, if you want to um, grab a cup of water or something first. Yeah. Sorry about that. All right. Uh, so now we're opening up to the question part of the uh, presentation. Uh, does anyone have any questions for Frank? I actually had one. Um, he talked about um, modifiers to slow down the reaction so it wouldn't explode or become a bomb. I'm mm -hmm. kind of concerned how they do that. Hmm. Okay, yeah, so safety features as well as the physics of how do you uh, slow down uh, a reaction? How do you, yeah, how do you uh, keep a reactor in a safe operating condition? Yeah, okay, that's a really excellent question. So um, obviously it's, it's going to take more than 20 minutes to, you know, describe, um, um, you know, hmm. the science of nuclear. I think it was uh, slide eight um, is where, um, uh, if you go one more slide back, yeah, that one right there. That, that's the one okay. where uh, I was. Uh... Right. So this is what we see at the uh, uh, atomic level in terms of the actual reaction, right? And, and so um, what typically happens is, um, so this is the actual fuel. Um, mm -hmm. So these are the pellets and inside is um, enriched uranium, enriched uranium, which means um, only 3% of it is actually active. 
so there's different forms of uranium. Um, so 235 is the one that's fissile, which means it's prone to mm, breaking apart uh, when it's bombarded by neutrons. Uh, so you're, you're, what you're seeing is that only a very small percentage actually needs to react to have a reaction. And, and so um, what, what they do is they put these pellets in, um, um, let me see if I can find an example here. What, while you're finding that example, why is it only 3%? Okay, so that's a really good question. Uh, otherwise, the reaction will go out of control. So uh, this is why they call this um, fuel, not fuel grade. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it is fuel grade uranium versus weapons grade, which is like 20%. Oh, okay. So it, because it's highly reactive. And it, it, it like become, the higher the percentage, it becomes more unstable? <clears throat> um, that's one part, but it, it's just, it reacts extremely quickly. Oh, okay. Yeah, so the fuel pellet, it's, um, it's actually arranged in a fuel rod. Oops, I want to see if I can give you an example of that. Okay, are you seeing, are you able to see my browser here? Uh, nope. Uh, no. You okay, let me kind of switch to a browser here. Okay, so that pellet that I just showed you. Um, so if you look at the center of this picture here, this is the actual pellet, right? And then the pellet is uh, put into these rods. So it's, um, yeah, these are like four meter rods and um, there's just hundreds of these pellets which are um, put into this cladding. Um, and so, it's a combination of uh, graphite uh, that's put into it to, um, to slow down the neutrons. And then you put these rods in the, um, um, in your reactor, they put water in it and uh, the water moderates uh, the neutrons. And so that's how you control the, um, the reaction. So I, I just looked it up. It's, it sounds like uh, there's 18 million fuel pellets inside of uh, the fuel rods. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it's a huge number of them. There's like 50,000 fuel rods uh, and then 18 million fuel pellets inside of those. Yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So how do you bombard uh... Uh, how, do you, how do you shoot neutrons? Okay, so that's also a really good question. Um, initially, you have, you supply it with, um, I believe, an isotope of uh, californium. So californium is, you know, also another um, heavy element. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's californium-252, and um, by its nature, it, it does um, break down, and it's breaking down fast enough that we, we have a neutron source that would initiate the reaction to produce heat, but it would not be so fast that it would um, melt down and blow up. So the, the very initial uh, neutron that you see here would be supplied by Californium. So uh, California is going undergoing some sort of a, I guess, what was it called? Like decay or something? Nuclear decay? Yeah, natural decay. So uh, we have this concept called half-life, right? Um, so nuclear reactions uh, have a half-life, which means if you start with, say, uh, let's say you have one kilogram of uranium, right? Uh, and it takes, you know, uh, I, f I forgot the number, maybe it's 10,000 years before half of it's degraded. So the half-life of that element is you know, 10,000 years. And then if you, um, if you wait another 10,000 years, it would go down to one quarter of that, the original quantity. So um, that, yeah, that's, that's the concept of the half-life. 
Yeah, thanks for the refresher course. I forgot that well, stuff. Um, yeah. I, I noticed that some of the um, the uranium, the, the 235s, they have like little holes in the center of the pellets. What, what are those for? Um, you mean here? Yeah, uh, like those, those don't have holes on them, but like the picture I'm showing up, uh, the uranium oxide fuel pellets, they have mm -hmm. like little holes in the center of them. Do you, do you know what those are for? I, I don't know offhand. It, it could be the graphite that's also um, used as part of the moderator. Okay. So Frank could... Um... I, I can explain that. Yeah, I think the idea of the uranium holes is that you introduce a compression mechanism, don't you? Inside these, um, inside the pellets. Mm. It, it, all, enhan it enhances when, when the fission. Excuse me? When you're assembling it or, you know. In no, the, during the reaction, they, they have oh, little okay. holes inside of it to introduce a compression reaction so that it, um, it sort of goes like, like this. <laughs> And oh, it enhances awesome. the reaction. I just posted a, a picture of a uh, of it on the chat uh, from uh, uh, Live Science, but you'll see what I'm talking about. There's like these little holes that they have. Looks like they've drilled in the center of them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of interesting. So Frank, um, could I remember touring Slack once, and I was always wondering if like a proton accelerator or or accelerators can they be used to produce nuclear energy in a different way? Uh, that's a really good question. I, I, I don't know enough uh, particle physics to say, maybe, maybe Charles has an opinion on this, but I, we do know that if you um, have proton beams, they can be used to, to smash um, atomic, uh, or nuclear other uh, elements. Sorry, what, what was the question again? And by the way, this is Carl. I have a, a, an answer to that. That's, I think that's a, the question was, can you use a proton beam to push reactions forward well to produce nuclear energy i guess was my question yeah. Could, yeah yeah and the answer is the two ways that frank described are ways that you can make nuclear energy if you don't have technology you don't have a transistor you don't have a laser you don't have a tokamak so it just happens that you can get enough uranium together in one place that it'll light itself on, upon a fire and you don't need a proton beam or something like that but we haven't really explored as a culture all the ways that you can break atoms or stick them together if you have all those fantastic tools that involve electronics and technology. Because we kind of declared nuclear energy complete back in the 1960s and we haven't really changed it since. I guess the answer is yes, we just don't know. We haven't well, really I, 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 I would say the answer is there's probably a hundred ways to do it and none of them has been reduced to a commercial or even military product yet, as far as we know. Yeah. I, I can add a little bit to that. And it's that, you know, proton, I mean, one of the things we have is um, proton radiotherapy in medicine. That's right. And what's unique about, um, uh, using protons versus other um, is that it, you know the, there's a certain stopping power that you have when you drive a proton through a material, and so you can design. Uh, and th this may not this sometimes isn't obvious to um, was not obvious to me when I first learned it, and this allows you to design very highly targeted proton beams, which allow you to do things like target cancer cells because you can really very precisely target where they go. Um, Literally, you can make them stop anywhere you want, depending on their, the energy that you put into them and the material that you're passing it through. So, um, you know, in, in that sense, uh, it, it certainly might be possible to, you know, use a proton beam. The, the, of course, the other point is that usually um, that requires a lot of equipment. And, you know, these devices really are quite simple, right? You just put uranium inside graphite. It just kind of goes on its own. Um, there's no... Uh, kind of like it, it's but that that would be the it may, maybe i don't know if i can look around and see if anyone's tried to initiate um some sort of fission reaction i mean there are known fission reactions when you know molecules pick up protons i mean you know atoms pick up protons that's absolutely a known reaction but i don't know if that was helpful but i just want to add that in there 
Yeah, I mean, I think I saw something a long time ago about um, Fermilab doing something around this, but um, it's been a while. I can there find are out, amazing actually. ideas out there. Like, you know, one thing you won't find anything written about is what happens if you take a lead and hit it with a proton beam. And I think there's a reason why nobody tells you what happens when you do that. But if you look at the uh, table of stability, you don't find much about what would lead would what would happen to lead if it were heavier, because there's really nothing stable near there that would result, which means you get an awful lot of energy. And lead is cheap, by the way, and the government can't stop you from buying it. So. So Carl, you're telling us how to make a bomb? <laughs> no, I don't think so. But I, but I, think, that you can make very, I think you can make a very nice uh, fission reactor with lead as the fuel. So the thing, the whole question of, you know, Frank described fusion systems and fission systems. And the real answer is that for various reasons, they work better together as a hybrid. And one successful example of a hybrid system is the hydrogen bomb. That's really a fission reactor with some hydrogen in it that starts a fusion process. But we can use fusion to allow unenriched fuel to become fissile. So, you know, the neutrons you get off fusion can be really useful for making fission happen instead of creating conditions where fission can create its own neutrons. So there's a whole lot of unexplored area there. And, you know, there is some fear over things that could be useful to the military. Um, but I think, you know, it's really pretty easy to make an atomic bomb anyway. And we're really threatening the planet with fossil fuels and we don't need to be doing that and we need to reverse the damage we've done so um, i think we need to find stable safe kinds of energy that are larger in magnitude and cheaper in cost so um, I, I i will i will add something to the proton idea uh, you know, you know, protons, it takes a lot of energy to get a proton to go into a nucleus because the nucleus is positively charged and the proton is positively charged. So they repel each other where, you know, neut neutrons do not. So I, I think there's probably a lot of work on uh, proton scattering. You know, basically, you know, a place like Slack, you can accelerate a proton and slam it into anything you want. And you, you would find that even the walls at Slack are radioactive because you've been you know, all the stray protons that come off. Um, but, you know, designing a machine to do this, you know, you'd have to be able, you'd have to accelerate the protons. Um, you, you need a way to accelerate them. Um, I, I think that some people think maybe that's what's going on in L &E and R. Uh, I talked to these guys, I talked to a guy uh, last weekend who thought maybe that was what was going on in L and R, that it wasn't proton-proton fusion, but it was actually uh, proton-palladium fission mm -hmm. or something like this. That they think that I mean yeah, that's what they think is probably what's happening. You know, one of the other hundred uh, theories of LNR. Um, uh, but that that's that would be primarily the problem is is getting the proton up to either reducing the Coulomb barrier through screening, like um, what Larry Forsley suggested, or and or finding some way to accelerate it. Yeah, well, actually, we know how to accelerate it, and it is a thirty million dollar laser, but you can buy them. And if it was part of a commercial process, it would probably be a $3 million laser in a short period of time. So. You, you. Okay. Interesting. I thought that I, I, okay, sure. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I did, I would not, I'm not that familiar with laser induced proton. I mean, I usually I think right. of an accelerator is as, you know, large electric field. Yeah, no, you can accelerate protons with a laser in a wake field. Um, okay. Okay. That, that, that makes, okay. And, you know, of course, when we declared nuclear energy mature in the 1960s, the price of a laser was infinity because they hadn't been invented yet. Oh, no, no, sure, sure. So. Yeah. 
that's funny uh, how you were mentioning that they hadn't been bidden yet. Uh, I'm looking at, uh, I got this old book, uh, The Future of Energy. It was uh, from Epcot Center. I, I found it at a thrift shop. And they were talking about uh, um, how they were working on inventing a 300,000 joule laser uh, called Nova uh, for use <laughs> in, the, in the late 80s. So th this book came out, I think, uh, early, early 80s. So it's just, yeah, 1984. <laughs> so it's just kind of funny just, uh, um, you know, how technology has changed so much. But they got some great uh, illustrations on, you know, how the uh, nuclear fission and fusion works on here. So a question for the non-engineering science people. Do people in general know how electricity is made? You're talking about like uh, the uh, the turbines, like with what? the nuclear, how it like uh, controls the turbine to create the energy. Turbine and generate. Like you understand this? Yeah. You understand the concept? Yeah. Yeah, you rub a piece of silk on a balloon. <laughs> <laughs> or you have, you hire many cats <laughs> to run around the circle. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so people do understand the concept of how you create just electricity in general. Yeah, you fly a kite in a thunderstorm. I don't know why I keep setting myself up for this one. <laughs> well, you know, it, it, it's a really it, it's a really interesting process. You should you should. Um, it's not all obvious. I don't think. Yeah, 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 for the for for many of the people who who did not do engineering, so this is it's interesting, right? In this illustration, there's a condenser to reduce, you know, to to take the steam to bring it back to a liquid form, and you were saying, uh, Frank, that in the Ch the new Chinese nuclear uh, plant, they just actually just use the steam to heat homes or heat to just produce industrial or commercial heat. Yeah, so some of the, there'll be a second stream uh, and that, that heat is then transferred to uh, steam tunnels for in the entire district. Okay, and so they've already, they've already implemented this? This is, this is active already? This, com this part of the plant is active? Yeah, so this is the one that I think came online last week um, because their goal was, okay, so in, in China, they burn coal inside their homes uh, for heating during the winter and that's extremely, Toxic. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, if they can avoid that by using, you know, uh, radiators, you know, using steam radiators, then that that you're solving a huge problem there. Um, so that that's, and I, I believe some Euro European countries are also doing that already. Um, but what what this means is there, are, you know, there are applications besides electricity that are quite relevant for nuclear power. Okay. Uh, is there any plan on implementing that for like industrial heat for uh, for different purposes besides heating homes? Uh, so so this is where we do need the the you know MSR and, and the, uh, other um, mm -hmm. um, fourth generation reactors because we need higher temperatures, right? So I think the temperature coming out of the um, uh, the vessel here is maybe four or five hundred degrees, but for industrial heat, we want something close to like eight or 900. And that's what uh, MSR can achieve. Actually, I have a quick correction for you, Frank. The right. temperature coming out of the vessel is limited to a certain temperature because there's water in there. Yeah. So what's the highest temperature water can be no matter how much steel you put around it? Uh, I forgot, maybe 450? I don't know. I thought it was more like 300, but you may be right in practical. Okay. I know it's not very high. That's why, yeah, they don't use the current reactors for any industrial purposes. Right. So the fact that the water can only be about 300 C, you know, 100 C is the boiling temperature at uh, room temperature, room pressure. If you put a lot of steel around it, you can get it up to 300 mm -hmm. C without exploding. And that's expensive. But if you make it hotter it's going to become vapor no matter what you do and these reactors are really expecting the water to be liquid and not steam inside for a couple of important reasons so that means that a coal-fired power plant can be i don't know 1200 c mm -hmm. and 600 c at the turbines so yeah. that's yeah. why the turbines are cheap because the high temperature lets the turbines be small 
So in this picture, the turbines that you see in the middle there are way, way bigger than they would be if it was a coal-fired plant or a gas plant because they're dealing with pathetically cold temperatures. And then the cooling towers for the plant are ginormous because if the hot side's not very hot, then the cold side has to be really cold in order for you to get the temperature difference to turn into money. So the hotter the hot side, the less you need to worry about the cold side. That's right. Your whole plant can be a lot cheaper and more efficient because the, the bigger the difference between the hot side and the cold side, the more efficient it is and the less money you have to spend on that stuff. So that's why we save so much money. Yeah, so Charles says 374 is the absolute limit. Okay. And if you want to make a practical machine where it's disaster, if it reaches that temperature, you're limited to about 300 C. Is there an additive that they can add to the water to keep it, uh, to allow it to reach higher um, uh, temperatures? Nope. No. Uh, if you add additives, they would probably destroy a reactor. Got it. Okay. Well, and it would get less high. Every, any kind of additive is going to make it boil at a lower temperature. So. Got it. Okay. So the idea is to replace water with something that's stable at high temperatures. And one great example is a molten salt. Molten salt or you yeah. use something that's already a gas, like helium. So the state change is what kills you and causes an explosion. Because when water changes from liquid to gas, it gets 1,900 times bigger. And that blows the ceiling off your building, unless you build your building 1,900 times bigger than the reactor vessel. Hmm. Which, guess what? That's what they do. And it's great news for the contractors. But, it, but very expensive. <laughs> expensive for the rate payers, but who cares about them? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Frank, can you actually talk a little bit about what industrial heat uh, may, what possibilities are available with industrial heat? Industrial heat. So when you're talking about, um, I guess in this example, they're, uh, yeah, they're achieving 700 degrees, right? Um, so that's hot enough to drive, um, you know, chemical reactions from uh, refining. So yeah, obviously in, in the um, um, petroleum industry, you want to be able to extract different types of um, uh, short chain carbon molecules. So uh, those can then be used for you know everything from making plastics to um, uh, yeah you know heavy industrial materials um, so that's that's one example um, I think it's also hot enough to melt certain types of metals right and so uh, that's that's another major application and metals are also a big source of greenhouse gas emissions because we spend so much um, energy melting it and typically that's done with with coal. So that, that's the opportunity there is that we would be able to substantially reduce industrial coal usage. Gotcha. Uh, I don't know, yeah, and maybe glasses and other um, higher melting point steels. I, I, I don't know the melting points offhand, but uh, okay. yeah, those are the opportunities. Uh, I do know that uh, Ken and Brian, he, he also presented a specific opportunity of a byproduct from this as well? Was it the, I forgot the name of the fuel that he calls it, but it's called? Oh, synthaline. Synthaline, yes. I just uh, posted, uh, there, there's this liquid that when it's heated, it freezes. Um, uh, they were talking about physicists in France have discovered a liquid that freezes when it is heated. Uh, I just posted it in the, the chat. And, and that's what I'm thinking is like, if we have some kind of liquid that does the exact opposite, um, that you know when you add all this heat to it it actually cools down not completely freezing but cools down i think that could be like you know maybe a, a great start to changing the future well one thing they take advantage of in the molten salt fueled reactors is that most liquids just get bigger when you heat them most things yeah. get bigger when you heat it yeah and that has great benefit because they set the nuclear reaction up so that as the liquid gets bigger, 
the neutrons have less probability of hitting another uh, uranium and it actually self-stabilizes its temperature. So the fuel would reach a certain temperature and not get any hotter just because it gets bigger. Yeah. So there's nothing you can do to overpower that reaction. I mean, in terms it, of it like the- uh, stopping. So um, um, for something like an IMSR, it would not, it would not melt down because the, by heating it up, it, um, um, the atoms become further apart from each other and that fundamentally just slows it down. Yeah, it starts melted, so it can't melt any more than that. And it won't turn to vapor at any temperature that you could ever get anywhere near. So you don't have a state change to worry about. So you don't need to worry about something getting bigger and exploding. That's the beauty on, of science. On the, um, your question about the super cool, the um, liquids that freeze when you heat them? Yeah. So I just did a quick look up. They're talking about, um, they're talking about something very specific. They're talking about supercooled water, <clears throat> which is a non-equilibrium um, form of water. Uh, okay. it's, it's almost like a glacious form of water. And they're talking about it on a thin film. So this is a, you know, this is something which is a very, you know, it says like the title, scientists freeze heat water with heat, but they're talking about something which is, um, uh, they're talking about a super cooled water which has been placed on the surface of something. So it, it's it. a little deceptive. The title's a little deceptive. Got it. Um, okay. That being said, water is a very special material <clears throat> and one of the weirdest materials there is. And just about the only material that you could ice skate on. <laughs> what well, water expands when you freeze it, which is, which is um, uh, highly unusual. And the opposite of that is the op yeah exactly. And the opposite right. of that is how come you can ice skate? Because when you pressurize pressurize it with your skates, it turns back into a liquid long enough for you to skate down. Right. That's right. That's right. So it, it's quite special. Um, <laughs> no, they're just for the ice skating facts, right there. Well, it, <laughs> well you know it's. In many ways, it, it's, it's also in, in cloud form. It's very, it's also very, it's, water in general is just a very strange uh, uh, topic that really behaves very differently than what we, other things may behave. So I, I, I the more, uh, we, we expect other things to behave like water and they, they yeah. behave completely <laughs> differently, right? I think that, that's why it breaks our intuition because we're so used to, we're, our, all our intuition is around water, but it is, it behaves anomalously. Right. There are very few things that would form puffy clouds in the sky, for example. So how come they're clouds is actually a good thing to ponder if you're a scientist. Yeah, yeah and that, that complexity in the atmosphere also um, makes it very confusing for, not confusing for science, but makes it very confusing when you're thinking of it. It just think it, it acts very differently than anything else you would learn in science. So it, it makes it hard to model um, also on different scales. So, and you know, I've been watching this since I was in college in the eighties when my professor told me I was an atmospheric and ocean science professor. And he was, he told me the reason we can't predict the climate or the weather is because we don't understand water. And by that, I mean, clean water in a beaker. And so finally, we're starting to understand the things that were bothering him back in the 80s. But it's new work and it's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's a show on uh, Netflix uh, called Down to Earth with Zac Efron. And on the second episode, they have a whole episode about water on there. And that the water that we are drinking should have a high TD, uh, TDS count, which is total dissolved solids. And uh, it means that it has a high mineral count in it. And they were saying that when you have purified water that you're drinking or um, water out of your tap, you're not getting the minerals that you need. So when you're drinking that water, it's pulling the minerals out of your body because it's kind of, it's magnetic. Um, so when you have high mineral counts and you drink that water, it's putting minerals into your body, which is actually really good for you. Um, so that's what I'm kind of wondering about. It's like, if there's a certain additive to the water in certain minerals uh, that are, uh, could be used for um, 
uh, a better reaction, you know, that, that might be something to, to kind of look into is like, because if the waters have a, a, a lot of uh, minerals and like nickel, uh, iron, all those kind of things, it might have different reactions to them. That, that'd probably destroy the machinery. Um. <laughs> we probably don't want to think nickel, but yeah, like calcium, sodium, uh, magnesium, like in magnesium. small quantities. I, I said nickel, yeah. Ma magnesium, sorry. <laughs> Fortified water. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah if you if you watch that episode some of the water they were drinking in there yeah it, there's actually like things floating around in it and they're like it's actually good for you yeah well keeping water out of nuclear power plants is a good idea and generally even in turbines we use deionized water so that it doesn't damage the metals as badly huh Okay. They actually have found some additives to the water and nuclear power plants, which is one reason they extended the lifespan of them. But those are um, some sort of detailed things about the metallurgy to keep the metal from um, corroding and in fact reversing the damage that happens to the metal and helping it heal itself so that the plants can last 100 years. And that's good work, but I still don't think we should really expect things to last 100 years. We shouldn't be building these cathedrals. We should build things that we can throw away every 20 years and still make money. And, um, you know, and be able to iterate on our designs a lot faster. Because every time we build a new one, we build it better. So I really want to see, you know, some, some improvement in the technology. I was expecting yeah. to say uh, 50 years, Carl, because that, that, that's your warranty, right? Yeah, warranty. but you know, <laughs> we have operating reactors that are going on 60 years old, and yeah. they're expecting to be able to push them out 100 years. There's no reason why they shouldn't. Um, but, you know, I still think that that means we're foregoing the benefits of technology, and mm -hmm. things should be considered obsolete every five years. So... Um, kind of the Apple format. <laughs> the only technology I respect that's over a hundred years old is usually a cathedral. They work fine when they're old. <laughs> and, and great, acu uh, great acoustics also. <laughs> what, uh, what do you think of cathedrals that take more than a hundred years to build in Sagrada Familia in Barcelona? <laughs> I call that Spanish engineering. <sighs> <All right. laughs> I'll give you the drum roll on that, Richard. <laughs> I used to be a resident, and uh, when I give the tour of that place, they would hear construction sounds, and I would tell them, no, no, it's just actually a speaker playing construction sounds on a CD. <laughs> uh, can right. you get uh, iTunes? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's called uh, Sounds to Fall Asleep To. The Spanish Spanish Cathedral Worker edition. <laughs> Some things are not built to be finished. <laughs> that actually sounds more romantic in Spanish. I think. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Are there any other questions for Frank or anybody else on? Um... Yeah, yeah, Frank. So you're saying that hydrogen fusion reactor they don't expect it to be uh, ready till 2035. I mean, this is just to test the concept. It's not even- Oh, working, okay. Um, gotcha. Concept. So it right. may be some while before I, I can power my flux capacitor and time travel <laughs> back to 1955. Probably. That you gotta talk to Robert about. Oh, okay. it may but, be. Uh, th there are guys at MIT who think they can leapfrog that. So we visited them a couple years ago. Uh, it's, called, it's called a Commonwealth Reactor. And, and their innovation is that um, the magnetic fields that they're using for the reactor is uh, they use a superconducting material. So that means they can get far uh, higher magnetic strengths. And that means you can create the, the, the fusion reaction at a much smaller um, radius of the reactor. So I think they've gotten like over $120 million in funding. Um, so we'll see, you know, if, if their concept can be proven in the next few years, uh, maybe that, that's the opportunity when we get fusion. But, uh, yeah. Other than that, you know, the, there's that saying, right? Fusion is always going to be 30 years away, and that's been true since like 1960s. 
Yeah, I disagree, though. I think, you know, we have, you can make a fusion reactor in your garage um, <laughs> called Fusor since the 1950s. The only problem with a Fusor is it doesn't make money. But because it makes less energy than it you put in. But when you start doing things like hybrids with fission, uh, the economics can change thousandfold. And when you start to add things like transistors, the economics can change a thousandfold. And then when you take, you know, a thousand available isotopes off the periodic chart and play with them, um, I believe that our guys in Berkeley and the guys at NASA with Larry Forsley are doing something akin to fission, and it works now, and it's already posit energy positive. I think the Berkeley guys will be energy positive comparing the heat generated to the energy pulled off the wall very soon. So it depends on what you want to call fusion. Uh, the Eider guys are a special thing because how many great inventions do you know of that came from a committee formed of, by 35 countries? <laughs> well, I, I have a question about this. Maybe you guys may have thought about this more deeply. I, I don't really mention it with the fusion guys, but I mean, fusion produces tritium. I mean, not, not what, not what um, Larry or um, Robert are trying to do, but I mean, the either is would produce tritium. It's highly, it's highly radioactive and you can't contain it because it just seeps through the walls. You know, it's a, I, I've never really, under, I mean, when they first proposed, um, when they, when Monkhorst and, Ro, and Rostocker uh, and Bindebauer proposed Tri-Alpha, the whole selling point was that they could use boron as a fuel. I mean, I, I don't see any viable fusion system, you know, hot fusion system ever working using, without using a secondary fuel like boron because the amount of, it can, you would just produce an enormous amount. And I, I'm kind of puzzled by this because I, I keep seeing this, you know, you see it in the popular press and, and you know, people in the media that fusion is going to save us. And uh, it's the most most dangerous thing you could build. It, it produces- you, say, you don't mind to a tritium. There are worse things out there. Well, I, it, it, you can't contain it because it's so small. Mm -hmm. It will seep through anything. It just seeps, it will, you know, it seep right through the, the the, the walls of the steel. Yeah, and it, then it goes out to outer space pretty fast. Uh, I guess. Um, the flux is low. It's hydrogen. It likes to be in space. It doesn't like to be on Earth. Yeah, but on the way out, you know, it, 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 <laughs> as it's going through it, you know, it, it, it infects everything it touches. Um, and, and of course, it would also be highly explosive. Yeah. So, I, I, I mean, Eater produces an enormous amount of uh, radioactive waste. Yeah. So I, I don't, I, I don't, maybe, maybe it's the idea would float out, but I keep, you know, we see a lot of things in the literature, I mean, in the, in the popular media and I'm always just sort of puzzled. I mean, it even came up in our call the other day on this carbon yeah. capture. I'm like, why would anybody want fusion? That thing is, uh, it, it's totally unviable. Yeah. Um, well, from, uh, one thing that was interesting about the Leonard work of Bacris at Texas A&M yeah. in 1990 is he proved that he could make tritium and destroy it in the same reactor. And he got really, really negative um, attention from his faculty that tried to kick him out of the university for making such claims, but that's what his sure. data showed. So the Lenner process can create and destroy tritium. Well, Lenner is a different beast altogether. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, for, I mean, like Eater is just, I mean, I, I just put it over the group because people talk a lot about fusion. I'm just, what is he talking about? <laughs> you know, it's, but anyway, you know, yeah, we don't want to use eater as our example of what fusion should be. Eater is what happens when 35 giant governments to spend, decide to blow their research wad on something that can't possibly change the status quo and is therefore harmless. Doesn't threaten the oil industry at all. Gotcha. No, absolutely. Yeah, it's not a threat at all. That's right. That's a good way to put it. It's total. It's a total sham. Yeah. So. Okay. All right, I'll hold off from buying my DeLorean. <laughs> no, no, but it, it will work more like it was shown in the movie and not at all like Eater. <laughs> I, I, was, I was looking up uh, uh, when uh, Mike started talking about his DeLorean and uh, uh, all those things. I, I, 
IBM has a, um, I think it's a thousand uh, qubit, uh, what is it, uh, quantum computer coming 2023. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, the, your flux capacitor may be on the way soon. You never know. <laughs> <I'll do it>. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think quantum computing is going to be uh, the next renaissance of uh, where we go. It's going to be yeah. quite amazing. Well, and the pace of change ex accelerates because it's so much easier to do stuff now than it used to be. Like when we imagine a new electronics device or a new kind of computer, we pretty much imagine it, get it in AutoCAD or CAD tool, and then send the file to a San Jose factory that can make it in less than a week. And we can actually try it. So the efficiency of experiment now is, you know, a thousand times what it was in the Apollo days. And even that is yeah, com yeah. compared to anything that was done in nuclear. So, you know, anybody who tells you what's going to happen 10 or 20 years from now is lying because they're pretending that technology doesn't happen and doesn't accelerate. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's, it's hard to fathom that if you think 10, about what, 12 years ago, iPhones didn't exist. And now everyone today has a smart computer in their pocket. I mean, that's just, it's just hard to fathom that, you know? That's right. And the FAA still regulates aviation so that the World War I airplanes should be allowed to fly without an iPhone in them. Yes. <laughs> if we just required every airplane to have an iPhone in it, we could really improve <laughs> aviation. <laughs> this is what you get for your DeLorean. <laughs> <laughs> Hey man, it's 2020. Back to the Future Two happened this year, I think, or is it next year? Was it Back to the Future Back Two? To the future. Yeah. By the way, I have a trophy in my closet that is derived from the DeLorean, uh, and I'm just waiting for someone to succeed at Cold Fusion so that they can get the uh, the trophy. Oh. <laughs> That's a good financial. <laughs> it looks like they go to uh, 2015. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, never mind. Yeah, yeah. Well, we passed that. Okay. <laughs> uh, we ended with Research Woman. I think that's mm -hmm. a that's a good uh, conversation. <laughs> good did job. Break? Oh, we did lose. <laughs> we lost the lecture. <laughs> <laughs> well, Frank did an awesome job on that presentation. You did. Yeah, great yes, job, Frank. Frank. Great job. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everybody. We have one more of these Let's Learn Some Things for the calendar year of 2020. Next week, Megan's okay, going to go step by step on, on uh, teaching us the video game making process in the industry. So, oh, God. She's back. Hey, guys. She's back. Hey, uh, <laughs> hey Carl. Can you, can you do me a, a favor and uh, take uh, some pictures of that robot for me? I, I, I have something I would like to work on for you with that. Okay. <laughs> She's made her appearance to the meeting. Yeah, I, I like how you're keep, uh, <laughs> you're keeping her at uh, PG level. <laughs> uh, that's good. <laughs> no, that's the way. <laughs>